Hello, welcome to lecture 2 of this course. In the last lecture, we had a discussion on the brief history of quantum entanglement and its significance. In fact, the last lecture was a very general introduction. Uh, as I said, that in this course, we are not going to focus on the philosophical aspect of quantum entanglement. Rather, we are going to discuss the technical uh, subject here, uh, technical aspect of the subject. And to do so, we need to know some elementary quantum mechanics and that's what we are going to revise in this lecture today. And also we need to know some mathematical tools. So beginning with this lecture uh, today, we are going to start discussing some mathematical tools and then we'll continue that in the next lecture as well. So let us begin. In this lecture, we will revisit the fundamentals of quantum mechanics that is relevant and necessary for understanding quantum entanglement and its measures. We will uh, start with discussing the postulates of quantum mechanics followed by a discussion on two-level quantum system and as a two-level quantum system we are going to consider the so-called spin-up quantum systems. You will find this discussion very useful later on in this course. We will discuss uh, all the necessary mathematics as we move along and already I assume that you know some elementary quantum mechanics. This particular lecture is based on the first chapter of this classic book called Modern Quantum Mechanics. Uh, it is written by J.J. Sakurai and Z. Napolitano. If you really want to learn quantum mechanics in a deeper level, I recommend this book very highly. Now let me begin by discussing what we mean by state of a system or a particle in classical physics. As you know, that classical physics is primarily based on Sir Isaac Newton's work. Newton was a genius and uh, in fact uh, his laws uh, of motion were quite counterintuitive. For example, his law f is equal to ma uh, you see here he said that the force is directly proportional to acceleration uh, which is basically the rate of change of velocity he did not say that force is proportional to distance or displacement right and ex experimentally this law is validated in our day-to-day -day life and all uh, the works of newton were uh, registered in his classic book called The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy in short called Principia. Now, in order to understand what I mean by uh, state of a system or a particle in classical mechanics or classical physics, let me give a very trivial example where let us consider there is a particle where no external force is applied on it this is going to result in this equation right and that means that uh, the rate of change of velocity along all the three directions are equal to zero and this basically means that the component of velocity are constant and can be a set equal to their initial values right so so if uh, say if the particle is at rest say vx of 0 is equal to 0 or this is 0 vz of 0 is 0 at time t is equal to 0 if the particle is at rest it is going to be at rest or if it is in uniform motion it is going to remain in uniform motion and uh, this is precisely the so-called newton's first law in fact, from this equation, one can easily obtain this uh, very simple differential equations and if its solutions are trivial and all of you know that this is uh, going to be the solution for this particular example, what it uh, says is that if you know the initial position and the initial velocity of the particle, uh, we can know its future position uh, at a later time. So, in short, uh, this solution is written in this form. 
and this is the way uh, this basically gives us the hint that uh, if we know the initial position and initial velocity or momentum of a particle we will be able to predict its future trajectory and this is used to define the state of a particle in classical physics uh, we can in classical physics we can define the state of a particle or a system by assigning its position and velocity at a given time uh, if we can assign position and velocity or momentum of the particle at a given time we will be able to predict its position and momentum at a later time as well so this idea of defining or assigning the state of a particle however we cannot extend it further to quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics as you know because of the uncertainty principle it is not possible to know the position of a particle and its velocity or momentum along a, that particular direction along a particular direction with absolute certainty so this way of defining the state in classical physics cannot be incorporated into the quantum physics in quantum physics uh, we do that by the so-called wave function and as you know that quantum mechanics is the result of works of many many scientists and physicists for example Arvind Schrodinger, Warner Heisenberg, Albert Einstein and there are many many scientists who contributed significantly to quantum mechanics in the development of quantum mechanics and one equation that is a very famous equation all of you know is the so-called Schrodinger equation it uh, tells us how a quantum particle how the state of a quantum particle evolves in time and this is the equation here this is the Schrodinger equation and in this equation the so-called psi here this psi is known as the wave function and it is postulated that the wave function contain all the information about the quantum system and here in this equation h is the so-called a Hamiltonian right and H cross here this H cross is basically the reduced Planck's constant it is H divided by 2 pi okay we are going to define the state of a particle by the so-called state vector in a complex vector space which is also called the Hilbert space and uh, it is postulated that all the information the complete information of the system for example an atom with a definite spin polarization uh, or orientation is represented by the state vector and the state vector is called as per the Dirac uh, uh, the British physicist Dirac this state vector is called Kate vector and it is denoted by say by the symbol Kate alpha say Kate alpha or you can denote it by say kate psi right and this state kate is postulated to contain the complete information about the physical state and everything we are allowed to ask about this state is contained in this uh, state vector uh, kate alpha or kate psi in fact if we want to know about some information about the system or the particle let's say it is represented by this kate psi and if you want to know about the momentum then you have to operate on the state vector by the so-called momentum operator uh, say if you want to know the x component of the momentum then you have to operate on the uh, state vector psi by this momentum operator in fact in uh, class uh, in quantum mechanics uh, corresponding to every uh, you know the physical observable in classical mechanics there is a corresponding operator and this is an important statement let me write it uh, corresponding corresponding to every physically every physically observable in classical physics in classical physics there is a chorus uh, there is an operator okay there is an operator in quantum mechanics 
this is a very important statement as you can see in my example here in this example if i want to know the information about the momentum then i have to operate on the state vector by the momentum operator if i want to know about the energy of the system then i have to operate on it by the hamiltonian operator n and, and uh, so on let us now discuss more about kate vectors we have already got to know that kate state uh, which is a state vector in the complex vector space contains all the information about the physical state of a particle let me mention some useful properties uh, of kate vectors for example uh, say one important property is that if there are two kates say kate alpha and kate beta they can be added and addition of these two kate is going to result in an another kate say gamma okay this is one property uh, another one is that if you if you multiply a kate by a complex number say c it is going to result in an another kate say it is going to result in kate say kate delta one of the most useful property is that if there is an arbitrary kate say kate psi it can be written as a superposition of uh, basis kate say these basis kates are kate i and this is ci ci is a complex number so this is i i'm going to break the uh, break it down uh, i'm going to explain it you see here ci is a complex number in fact you can understand it if you uh, can draw an analogy let me draw an analogy uh, from your usual vector space in the usual vector space you know that if there is a vector say e say electric field it can be written as e x x cap e y y cap and e z z cap right so here x cap y cap and z cap are the so called unit vectors along the usual this three direction x y and z respectively and here e x e y e z are real numbers and we say that x cap y cap and z cap uh, span the three dimensional vector space so x cap y cap and z cap these three uh, unit vectors or the basis vectors they are said to span the three dimensional because users require three unit vectors or the basis vectors to represent an arbitrary vector so we say that x cap y cap and z cap span the three dimensional vector space this in the same way what we can say is that if there is an arbitrary kate psi is there if i can write it as a superposition of basis kate say kate i where i runs from say i is equal to 1 to n in that case we say that this basis vector span the n dimensional uh, complex vector space so here here the basis vectors or basis kates rather let me write basis kates the basis kates span the n dimensional n dimensional complex vector space complex vector space all right uh, just to give you an example so you know uh, you may have heard about the so called qubit qubit is a two state uh, system uh, if you if i talk about a qubit we are going to talk a lot about qubit in this course uh, a qubit we can it's any arbitrary states uh, say kate alpha if i represent the arbitrary state of a qubit by kate alpha i can express it it in terms of the basis kate say kate 0 and kate 1 in this form say kate alpha is equal to say c0 uh, kate 0 plus c1 kate 1 where c0 and c1 are complex numbers and kate 0 and kate 1 right these are the basis vectors and this uh, we say that these basis vectors are spanning the two dimensional kate space 
and here this k0 may represents the ground state while k1 represents the excited state of a two level system suppose this is the ground state so this ground state is represented by k0 and the excited state is represented by k1 again you may recognize that this coefficient c0 c0 basically gives you the probability of finding the system or the qubit probability of probability of finding the qubit qubit in ground state okay qubit in ground state and similarly k uh, c1 okay c1 it's a complex number to c1 mod square gives you the probability of finding the qubit finding the qubit in state one in the excited state uh, i think uh, you you already re recall that uh, what the significance of this coefficient and i'm sure you have already seen it now let me talk about the so-called brass space brass space is a complex vector space and it is dual to the so-called kth space it's a dual and i'm going to explain it what i mean by dual it's dual to kth space okay actually corresponding to corresponding to every kth every kth say alpha there is a there is a bra denoted by uh, say by this symbol okay in the hilbert space in the hilbert space you will soon uh, see the significance of this bra space uh, let me give you some examples for example as i said the dual uh, to this kth alpha say let me say dual correspondence to kth alpha is bra alpha the sum of two kths say kth alpha plus kth beta its dual is also going to be another uh, uh, basically the sum of two the corresponding bras so that is bra alpha plus bra beta it's exactly the same property addition of these two bras is going to result in an another bra and now important difference is here that if you multiply this k alpha by complex number c the dual would be the corresponding bra of the k alpha but now it is going to be multiplied by a number c but not c it would be the complex conjugate of c okay this is the difference as i have given you the example of this qubit where we represent the arbitrary state of the qubit as a superposition of k0 and k1 right the in the dual correspondence uh, in the brass space would be simply c0 as you can see from this particular property it would be c0 complex uh, uh, bra uh, 0 plus c1 complex bra 1 okay the notion of bra space is actually useful to define the so-called inner product and inner product is an important concept uh, as regards the mathematics is concerned in quantum mechanics using Dirac notations it is defined like this suppose you have a k at alpha and a bra beta is there the inner product is defined by this it is basically the multiplication of the this bra beta k uh, bra beta and then this k alpha right so this is how the inner product uh, is defined and in general this product is a it is a complex number this is a it's a it's a complex number so this you have to remember it's simply a oh okay one minute it's a complex number 
uh, some important properties of inner products are uh, these two important properties let me mention so say the inner product of ket alpha and ket beta is equal to this inner product is not equal to bra alpha uh, you know and ket beta rather it's complex conjugate so that means that uh, this one beta alpha this inner product is uh, or let me say this one and uh, alpha beta okay this inner product are complex are complex conjugate to each other are complex conjugate to each other i think this is clear to see from this expression here also you should note this another important property is that the inner product of a ket with its corresponding bra is always greater than or equal to zero right if it is equal to zero then we say that ket alpha is a null ket and this property inner product if it is inner product of a ket with its corresponding bra is greater than zero uh, or greater than or equal to zero this particular property is known as the postulate of positive definite metric positive definite metric okay this is just a terminology you need not have to bother much about it and two kates you know uh, alpha and beta are called orthogonal ket alpha and ket beta are orthogonal orthogonal to each other if uh, this inner product alpha beta is equal to zero now this is an important property this orthogonality properties we are going to utilize it again and again in this course uh, for more information on Dirac bracket not notation and its algebra you can pick up any quantum mechanics book particularly the one that i have already mentioned i have mentioned about the sakurai book uh, now we'll talk about operators as i said uh, for every physically observable in classical physics there is an operator in quantum mechanics an operator x on a state vector say a ket say ket alpha from the left hand side okay and this will result in an another ket say ket beta in general uh, and operators operators are linear operators are linear what I mean by linear to understand it let me consider the qubit state that I defined some time back say arbitrary qubit state is there say c0 k0 plus c1 k1 if we operate on this by an operator then this will give us say c0 a k0 plus c1 a k1 so in this sense the operator a is linear in the case of uh, bra uh, an operator always operates on a bra say bra alpha from the left okay and this is again going to result in another bra say bra gamma however uh, one need to be careful about the dual correspondence uh, between the uh, between the ket and the bra operation for example if i operate take this operation operator a operating on ket alpha its dual correspondence would however be given by say dual correspondence would be given by bra alpha but here it would not be a but rather it would be a dagger which is basically the a dagger this is the so-called uh, Hermitian adjoint a dagger is the Hermitian adjoint or simply the adjoint Hermitian adjoint of the operator a okay an operator A is said to be Hermitian 
इफ ए इज इक्वल टू ए देगर लेट मी डाइग्रेस ए लिटल बीट एंड लेट अस रिकॉल अबाउट व्हाट वी मीन बाय हार्बिसियन इन द कॉन्टेक्स ऑफ ए मैट्रिक्स ओके हार्बिसियन मैट्रिक्स बिकॉज एज यू मे नो दैट एन ऑपरेटर कैन बी रिप्रेजेंटेड इन ए मैट्रिक्स फॉर्म इन ए एप्रोप्रिएट बेसिस वेक्टर्स एंड आई विल टॉक अबाउट इट लेटर मोर अबाउट इट लेटर टू अंडारस्टैंड हार्बिसियन मेट्रिक्स लेट मी टेक द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ ए टू बै टू मेट्रिक्स ए से एक्स इज इक्वल टू ए टू बै टू मेट्रिक्स लेट मी से इट इज वन टू प्लस से आई माइनस आई से माइनस वन दीज आर द एलिमेंट्स इन द मेट्रिक्स देन एक्स डेगर द हार्बिसियन कन्जुगेट और एट जॉन्ट ऑफ दिस मेट्रिक्स एक्स उड बी बेसिकली द complex conjugate of this matrix x and then if we take the transpose right so in this particular case if i take the complex conjugate i will get 1 2 minus i i and minus 1 and if i take the transpose then i will get 1 2 minus i here i minus 1 as you can see that in this case this x dagger is not equal to x so therefore x is not a hermitian matrix however if we take say say a matrix b is equal to say 1 i minus i minus 1 so in this case the b dagger uh, the hermitian edge joint would be simply if you first you take the complex conjugate okay this is what you will get and then if you take the transpose then this is going to result in 1 minus i i minus 1 and this is exactly the original matrix b so in this case this matrix so this implies that b is hermitian so i think just it's for recalling purposes i'm mentioning it uh Uh, another thing you should note is that the hermitian adjoint of a uh, you know the product of two operators say a b product of two operators if i take the hermitian uh, adjoint of this product it is going to be equal to product of the hermitian conjugate of b dagger a dagger please uh, just note down the note the order in which they are multiplied now sometime back uh, we define the so called inner product so sometime back we define inner product between two kets in fact it was defined like this so this was what the so called inner product so there is something called outer product as well and outer product outer product is outer product is defined in this form it is basically product between a k beta and a bra say alpha and this would be simply like this now this resulting product resulting operation is an operator it's an operator on the other hand in the case of the inner product it's just a number it's in general it is a complex number right so this is a, a huge difference between inner product and outer product uh now coming back to the operation of an operator on a ket many times we get suppose we have this ket a ket alpha and if we operate on this by the operator a then what may we get is that we may get the same ket and multiplied by a real number say a whenever we have such kind of a situation and this is basically known as the eigen value equation in this case this uh, ket alpha is called an eigen ket because of its peculiarities uh, it's called eigen ket and this operator a is called an hermitian operator it is called an 
Hermitian operator and this A is called the eigenvalue. Hermitian operators are important because uh, if that is the case, whenever you have this eigenvalue equation, all the physically observable quantities in classical mechanics are represented by Hermitian operators in quantum mechanics. Okay, we'll talk more about it now. There is a very important theorem in quantum mechanics that says that the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator A are real and the eigenkets of the operator A corresponding to different eigenvalues are orthogonal. This is a very important theorem and I think uh, it is worth uh, to uh, prove it and let me show you how to prove it. Uh, you know that uh, this eigenvalue equation so a a ket a is equal to a a where ket a is the eigen ket and a is the number eigenvalue and let's say this is equation number one and because this operator a is hermitian uh, we can also have that if if uh, the operator a operates on a bra b and it operates uh, from the left it is going to result in say this equation say b complex and uh, it's a number complex number b right so this is what we have and then say this is my equation number two now let me multiply equation one uh, by the ket uh, by bra b uh, from the left uh, so let me do this from equation one if i take this operation i'm multiplying both sides uh, then this is what i will get i'm multiplying it by bra b then this is what i will get say so let me say this is equation number three and uh, multiply both sides of equation two by ket a uh, on the right so if i multiply equation number two uh, from the right uh, by this gate A, uh, this is what I will get. Okay, I think it is easy to follow. Let's say this is my equation number four. Now, let me subtract equation three and four, subtract uh, three and four, and then you can easily get. Uh, 3 and 4 if you see then you will get 0 is equal to a minus b star this inner product right this is what you will get and this is an important equation now and from here this we can easily see what the theorem says now if say a and b are uh, same say a and eigen this numbers a and b are same then clearly what you will get you will get a is equal to a star right and uh, this implies that uh, a is real a is real uh, because you will say you will get a this inner product would be equal to one so that's what the first uh, uh, part is proved that the eigenvalues of Hermitian operator eigenvalues of Hermitian operator a are real now regarding the second part now let us say a and b are different if a and b are different a and b are different that means if the eigenvalues corresponding to the operator a uh, are different then you will get this inner product would be equal to zero so this clearly shows the result that the eigenkets the second part the eigenkets uh, the second part the eigenkets of a corresponding to different eigenvalues are orthogonal so this is a very important theorem it's say one of the basic theorem uh, related to uh, quantum mechanics 
It's a convention to write the inner product of two eigenkets in this form. We can write the inner product as this. This is delta B is the so-called Kronecker delta, where this Kronecker delta is equal to 1 if B is equal to A. And that means the eigenkets are same. And it is equal to 0 if the eigenkets are different. Right, and this is already we have seen. This is a uh, useful expression. Let me now discuss how eigenkets can be used as basis gates. In fact, I have already discussed similar things earlier. Any arbitrary gate, any arbitrary gate, this is an arbitrary gate, can be expanded or expressed as a superposition of eigenkets here this is the eigenket as a superposition of eigenkets let me say this is an important expression equation one i can now utilize this condition uh, orthonormality condition it is called if i multiply equation one by say bra b then i will get here this would be C A bra B A. Then I can write this expression because of this relation that I have written here. I can write it as C A delta B A. And uh, this delta B A is equal to 1 if B is equal to A. So I will uh, it will result in only C B. So I have C B is equal to B alpha, right? And clearly, uh, similarly, I can write because of this, I can write C A is equal to A alpha. This one, this coefficient now I can, this is just a number, it's a complex number. I can use this expression, uh, uh, you know, here in this, in this equation. Because it's a number, I can write it uh, this side also. So if I do that, then I have this gate alpha is equal to sum over a let me first write here this gate a and the number this a alpha right and this is very useful and from this you can immediately see that this is going to lead us to this particular equation and this equation is a famous expression in uh, quantum mechanics this expression is called the uh, equation is called the so-called completeness condition complete this relation what it effectively means is that if this relation is satisfied this means that this eigenkets a all the eigenkets uh, span the uh, linear vector uh, this Hilbert space, right? This is what we mean by the completeness, completeness relation. Now, let me quickly uh, talk about the matrix representation of an operator and you will immediately see the usefulness of this complete relation there. Uh, let me consider this matrix, say, or say operator A. I can multiply both sides of these operators by this uh, identity operator. By the way, here this two, it looks like one. It's basically the identity operator. So I can multiply both sides of this uh, operator by the identity operator. And by dint of this completed rela completeness relation, I can write it as in terms of the basis gates or the eigenkets. Say A, A this is equal to 1 and then for the another one i can write sum over b i get gets so this is what i have right when i say when we talk about the matrix representation of an operator a so what actually we mean by the representation matrix representation is this particular expression so this one we mean let me explain it by using a, a simple two-dimensional gate space. Uh, consider, let me say, 
consider a two-dimensional cage space. All right, and that is a span by the span by eigen gates, uh, eigen gates one, gate one and gate two. Let me write here gate 1 and gate 2 these are the eigen gates users need to have only two eigen gates because it's a two dimensional gate space then i can write this expression uh, i can just expand it and then i can write let me write all the terms i'll have first term would be this say this one then the second term would be one one a 2 2 then I'll have 2 2 a 1 1 I think you can easily see this is be 2 2 a 2 2 right if I expand it this is what I am going to get so now as regards matrix representation is concerned then I can write it uh, it as a 2 by 2 matrix with the elements of the matrix would be uh, this uh, first term would be 1 a 1 second term would be 1 this is the first row and then this is going to be my second row and uh, first column and this is the second row second column i think you can see it and uh, what you see that in this representation in this matrix representation here this particular one this bra is referring to the rows and this is referring to the column now we'll discuss the case of a two-level quantum system uh, as an example we are going to consider the so-called spin hub quantum system you will find this uh, very useful later on when we'll discuss the so-called epr paradox but before that let me make some general comments about spin and i'm sure all of you have studied about spin in an elementary quantum mechanics course you know that spin is an intrinsic angular momentum of a quantum system particularly elementary particles and it has no classical counterpart and one cannot measure the components of spin uh, simultaneously for example you cannot measure the x component and the y components of the spin simultaneously and this is revealed in the so-called commutation relation between the operators you know the commutation relation between the operators uh, spin operators x component of spin and y component of spin is, is going to result in this expression uh, we have other two relations, similar relation, commutation relations for the other components. Say as commutation between S Y and S Z is I H cross S X, and we also have S Z S X is equal to I H cross S Y, right? And we know that the eigenvectors or the eigenkets of a spin system is represented in Dirac notation by a ket which is characterized by two quantum numbers s and m s refers to the spin quantum number it is called the spin quantum number or simply it is called spin this is spin quantum number and m is the so-called magnetic magnetic spin quantum number magnetic spin quantum number actually this cage state is a uh, direct product of two cage states is the spin state and the magnetic quantum number so direct product is written by this and in shorthand notation this is how we represent the cage state and S can take half integers value uh, and integer value say 0, a half, 1, 3 by 2 and so on 
On the other hand, this magnetic quantum number can take value from minus s to plus s. So minus s, then minus s plus 1, and you will have s minus 1, and finally you will have s. Now, as regards the operators and eigenvectors are concerned, corresponding to the total spin uh, angular momentum operator, the square of the spin angular momentum and the z component of the spin satisfy this eigenvalue equation. So let me write it down. And these eigenvalue equations we can utilize for our analysis uh, later on. We'll see that. So this first one is going to give us h cross square s into s plus 1 sm. So clearly this is an eigenvalue equation and the next one is going to give us s cross m sm. So out uh, apart from these two important equations, we have another equation where let me first write it s plus minus sm is equal to h cross square root of s into s plus 1 minus m into m plus minus 1 and here we will have s m plus minus 1 and in this case s plus minus refers to sx plus minus i s y now let us discuss spin half quantum system spin half quantum system in such systems s is equal to the spin quantum number s or spin is equal to s is equal to half so clearly m can take value minus half and plus half this will result in two eigenstate one eigenstate would be s is equal to half m is equal to minus half and another eigenstate would be s is equal to half and m is equal to plus half in fact the first one s is equal to uh, plus half and m is equal to minus half this is called the spin down state and represented by this notation and sometimes it is uh, this uh, notation is also used minus you just put a minus there this is called spin down state spin down state and this particular kit s is equal to plus half and s m is equal to plus half refers to spin up state and it is sometime also uh, this notation is also used this kit notation is used it is called spin up state all right and these two eigen kits plus and minus can be taken as the basis vectors to describe a spin half quantum system so but before that uh, let me talk about the so-called completed completeness relation that we discussed some time back the completeness relation if you recall it was this relation where i is the identity operator this is i is the identity operator and for the spin half system for spin half system i can break it down like this and identity operator in this case it is a two-state system so it's the unit matrix one zero zero one in matrix representation now if we take uh, the up state as by represented by this column vector one zero and this will have the the corresponding bra would be this row vector one zero then if i take the outer product you can clearly see this would be one zero matrix multiplication of this and this is going to give us simply one zero 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 similarly if i take the down state uh, the minus yeah down state if i take it as zero one and then the corresponding bra would be the row matrix uh, row column uh, row vector zero one and if i take the outer product we'll get uh, 
simply 0, 0, 0, 1. So, as you can see uh, from this one, this one and this one, this is going to, if you put it here, you will get the so-called identity matrix. Now, this representation is going to help us a lot uh, whenever we want to write uh, any arbitrary kit in terms of a column vector. As you can see that if I have a arbitrary kit, uh, a spin kit, this is an arbitrary spin kit, arbitrary spin kit, spin state, right, spin half state actually here. Uh, this I can write as a linear superposition of the eigen kit, say a, chi, a plus and then say b minus. So this is the linear superposition of the eigen skates. Now because of the matrix representation of plus state that is your 1 0 and the down state is 0 1. So I can express it as a column vector like this a b. Okay. Now what about the matrix representation of spin operators. For example, we know that S z what about the matrix representation of the SZ operator? If you apply on the up state, you will get H cross by 2, uh, this up state, spin up state, and SZ minus is going to give us minus S cross by 2 minus, right? So if you take, say, let us take SZ, uh, it's in matrix representation. Let me say we have these elements are A, B, C, D. If I put S, Z as A, B, C, D here and plus state is 1, 0. This is going to give me H cross by 2, 1, 0. This, if you can easily see that this is going to result in A is equal to S cross by 2 and B is equal to 0. Uh, in fact, C here, you will get C is equal to 0 from this first relation you will get this and from the other one if sz is applied on the down state 0 1 you will get minus s cross by 2 0 1 and this is going to give us b is equal to 0 and d is equal to minus s cross by 2 so this means that my matrix representation for the z component of the spin operator would be h cross by 2 1 0 0 minus 1 right and similarly you can write sx the matrix representation for the x component of the spin would be h cross by 2 0 1 1 0 and sy would be equal to h cross by 2 uh, you will have 0 minus i i 0 Actually, all these equations, three equations, we can write it in the shortened notation by this S equal to S cross by sigma, where sigma is the so-called Pauli matrices. Sigma has the components, say, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Sigma, this is called the Pauli vector, Pauli spin vector. Sigma x is equal to 0, 1, 1, 0 sigma y is equal to 0 minus i i 0 and sigma z is equal to 1 0 0 minus 1 these are what remembering and we are going to use it later on let me stop for today in this lecture i have touched upon the bare minimum of quantum mechanics that is necessary for starting the subject of quantum entanglement in the next lecture, we will discuss the mathematical tool, in particular the so-called density matrix formalism. And density matrix is an extremely important tool and we have to master it because many of the entanglement measures are based on density matrix. And we are going to discuss that in great details in the next lecture. So, see you in the next lecture. Thank you.